Hugh Thomas, Baron Thomas of Swinerton, is a, not only an eminent writer, but a legislator in the House of Lords. And he's also essentially a historian. Not, not also, but essentially and mainly and brilliantly a historian. In fact, if I may be allowed to quote Fei Ho and read him, when Lord Thomas was 70, there was a part of the Spanish Embassy in London where I pointed out how he shows, he, Hugh Thomas, shows the three main qualities which are necessary in historians, according to Fei Ho. Being exceedingly sincere, disabused, and an excellent sectarian of virtue, which I think is, is a grand way of, of describing the virtues needed in a historian, <coughs> which uh, Lord Thomas has. Fei Ho said it about Father Mariana, but in the case of, of Hugh Thomas, there is something else that is even rarer than the three above mentioned virtues, very rare in historians. You never relish historical disasters in any nation, let alone the, the Spanish nation, but in, in, in no nation. Schadenfreude is not a sin of yours. Well, you have not only those virtues, but you are very hardworking, and you write very well. And so, if I may be allowed, I will quote this time two paragraphs from your own uh, book, the first volume of your history of the Spanish Empire, which you are now writing. Uh, both are perceptive, and in both I seem to detect not only the grand style of Gibbon, but a shadow of his irony as well. The first is this one. And it refers to the arrival in San Lucar de Barrameda of uh, Elcano after having been around the world. The sphericity of the earth was demonstrated. No greater achievements has been no, no greater achievement has been performed. It has been claimed rightly as a great Spanish triumph, and so it was. All the same, the captain on whom all depended was a Portuguese, and the best chronicler was an Italian, as so often in the case of adventures of the sixteenth century. Most of the crew were Andalusians, but the captain who led the return was a Basque. It is not clear what happened to the English constable, Master Andres of Bristol, who was among those who set out. We must assume, though, that he died in the Philippines. But we are, therefore, once again before a European triumph, appropriate for one which the greatest of the European rulers, the Emperor Charles V, a European more than he was a Spaniard, a Fleming, a German, or a Burgundian, approved. Magellan and Elcano had directed a voyage to the end of the world, which, of course, turned out to be the same port from which they had embarked. And San Lucas de Barrameda, the racy city where the river Guadalquivir flows into the ocean sea, in the shade of the palace of the Duke of Medina Sidonia and on the edge of the Sherry country, remains a place worthy to be considered the epicenter of the world. Now, dear Hugh, if I may call you, uh, as we've called each other for many years, that goes straight to my heart. Since I was born about 10 miles away from the epicenter of the world, uh, I'm uh, immensely flattered, but more seriously, I think that in this paragraph, and we'll talk about it afterwards, you uh, strike exactly the right note to explain the several uh, uh, strains of thought and action that coincided in the beginning of the Spanish Empire. The second 
surpasses, uh, in fact, a moral judgment. And uh, very balanced too, I think. You say, but the conquistadors did not seek only glory and gold. Most of them believed that the long-term benefit of their discoveries would be the acceptance by the natives of Christianity with all the cultural consequences that that implied. They knew, as the Spanish crown put the matter in 1504, that they were ennobling the new lands with Christians. They made their conquests with a clear conscience, certain that they were taking with them civilization, believing that they would, in the end, permit these new people to leave behind their backward conditions. Who can doubt now that they were right to denounce the idea of religion based on human sacrifice or the simple worship of the sun or the rain? As a 20th century French general wrote in the wake of his country's retreat from North Africa, every epoch has a way of looking at things which differs profoundly from what came before or comes afterwards. Fashion in this domain is fickle and usually influences us more than we suppose. We believe ourselves free and reasonable beings, but we are all of us, whether we like it or not, the playthings of great waves of ideas which carry us forward. So it was with the generation of 1500 in Spain. They knew that their mission was to seek new Christian souls. Gold and glory were the supporters of their coat of arms on which Christianity dominated the face of the shield. There is an echo of Gibbon in this as well. <laughs> but uh, certainly um, a much uh, kinder uh, historian than Gibbon. I would ask you to comment on something that you, you say, I think, in the first volume of, uh, of uh, the, the, this uh, history of the Spanish Empire. You say that in 1528, the three greatest men of the age were in Spain, Charles V, Hernán Cortés, and Francisco Pizarro. And I would like to ask you two things straight away. What did the three have in common with other great men and women, such as Cardinal Cisneros, and we are now in talking in the splendid hall of the university that he founded, Queen Isabella or King Fernando? Was it the mixture of Renaissance audacity with a Christian fundament in, in it? Audacity was the most important element which they had in common. Charles V was um, thought to be a cautious man, but he was prepared to take risks at every stage of his life and did so. Cortes uh, was a man who was completely able to improvise a decision if he hadn't thought of it before and did so quite often in his legendary conquest of, of Mexico. And Pizarro was also an audacious person. He was much less intelligent or much less cultivated than the other two. Um, for example, Cortes's letters to Charles V are very worth reading even now. They are a great Renaissance a piece of writing. Uh, they are very courteous, courtly, and perhaps a, a, a bit um, hypocritical in some ways, but they're very good. Uh, Charles V wrote interesting letters. Uh, Pizarro didn't write because he couldn't, but audacity was something they did have in common, and that's what carried them through uh, such, uh, such problems and did dangers and difficulties. Do you then think that uh, at that time beginning of the 16th century, there were other people who shared this typical Renaissance audacity and uh, took risks and uh, succeeded sometimes, most of the time. Uh, do you think that they had in common also this typical Renaissance attitude? 
I certainly think that the Catholic kings were disciplined as, as well as audacious. They uh, uh, knew how to plan and organize a, a reasonable economy, a reasonable kingdom. And they did that very well. Uh, the lines laid down by, by Ferdinand and Isabella are uh, the, the lines which the, Spain followed for the next, uh, next three, two or three hundred years. Mm -hmm. uh, only recently have a question, have questions been risen, raised about the, 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 the survival of the, the, of the settlement which they determined of the unification of Aragon, Aragon, Catalonia and Castile. But Ferdinand was more than the, the, the um, organizer of, uh, of a territory. Uh, he was organizer of kingdoms because there was not only <coughs> Aragon and Castile, but there was also Granada and there was Navarre, which he integrated into the Spanish adventure. Hugh, you have often warned us, your readers and friends, against the dangers of practicing or even enjoying counterfactual history, uh, of accepting as a legitimate uh, type of book the speculations on the ifs of history. What would it have been if this or that had happened? However, I see that you do drop some tantalizing hints of possibilities in the two volumes so far published of your history of the Spanish Empire, and uh, no doubt in the third volume, since it will end with the uh, renunciation of Philip II to the uh, Empresa de China, to the idea of in invading uh, China, you, I'm sure, will have speculated on what would have happened uh, if Philip II had gone ahead, which opens a host of possibilities. Do you still think that one should control any urge one may have to think of the ifs of history? Yes, I do. I don't think I talk much about ifs in uh, these two volumes. I don't say what would have happened if Cortes had been defeated by Montezuma, or if Pizarro had not conquered the Inca kingdom. It's true that in the forthcoming volume, I do speculate what would have happened if the Jesuit desire and the, uh, the Jesuit desire for the conquest of China, supported as it was by the Bishop of Manila and the governor of the Philippines, had been carried through. And I do have some entertaining passages which I wonder whether uh, some Spanish uh, grandee such as the Marquess of the Tamaron would have become a Duke of the Yellow River <laughs> in China. But I am quite conscious that there was a serious plan by the Spaniards to conquer China in the 1580s. Mm. And it was the fact that Philip II was defeated in the Armada, which made him uh, not decide to go ahead with it. But still, he, was, he played with the idea for quite a long time though he didn't make a decision uh, uh, for a long time either. Uh, it is, of course, a, a, a fantastic supposition what would have happened had China been uh, Christianized and conquered and became a, um, a province of Spain, a, a kingdom of Spain, no doubt it would have been called, as New Mexico, as New Spain, Mexico, and Peru did become too. Uh, it's a, it is a fantasy, but it is a fantasy which was entertained by many people at the time, mm -hmm. so I think I'm justified in discussing it. You are certainly justified, especially since you afterwards write so well. There's something else that is uh, not a fantasy, but um, something that did happen and that has perhaps not been uh, much uh, remarked upon. You haven't reached that point in, in your history, but there is a moment in the 18th century when there is a curious late-in-the-day surge northwards of Spanish uh, influence in the southwest, what is now the southwest uh, states, United States. 
uh, in California and, uh, and elsewhere, going north, enlarging the Spanish possessions at the end of the Spanish Empire in America. Uh, and the question I would like to ask you is whether there was a possibility, had that not happened, that the United States would be different now from what they are. In other words, do you think that the uh, presence of Spain um, in a big part of the United States of America, uh, in some cases from the very beginning of the discovery and conquest, such as Florida, and then much later in California, uh, did it make a difference in the present-day United States? I don't think it would be quite as different as we might like to imagine. Um, the word surge, I'm not sure I accept. Um, Spain did not uh, uh, go very far north until the independence of Mexico and the independence of, of the Spanish-American um, republics. Uh, 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 California, New Mexico, uh, Arizona, Texas were very badly populated by the Spaniards, or ill populated. There were very few people there at all. And um, the same is also true of the other places in Louisiana and Florida where the Spaniards did have colonies. Uh, Cuba is a slightly different problem, but uh, uh, it, it too was a possibility for for for, uh, re for remaining Spanish and being absorbed by the United States. The the possibilities of of Cuba entering the United States were never never dismissed lightly mm. uh, until the 1890s. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, this is a diversion, but. Uh, the number of presidential elections uh, in the 19th century in the United States, which were determined by the Cuba question, uh, is infinite. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, the, the, the other element that probably did leave some uh, mark, not, uh, um, not a slight one, in the United States was the, the uh, missions that were established uh, by Fray Junipero Serra and others um, along the west, what is now the western United States, uh, mainly California, yes. um, which perhaps um, is symbolized by the uh, unexpected presence in the capital of, of a statue of, of, uh, of Fray Junipero Serra. Um, but, but still, I, I was thinking more of the, not really of the political presence, which, uh, a, a, as you say, simply changed afterwards, but the um, historical or ideological presence or religious presence. Um, I don't know uh, uh, whether one can say that the Western, Southwestern uh, United States is more different from other parts of the states because of that. If, again, the ifs, which perhaps are not a, a legitimate historical uh, attitude, but still, it, it, it's a possibility. Maybe it wouldn't have been exactly uh, what it is now. The population was not big enough to make a major, mm. major contribution, I think. Mm. Um, of course, we know that in Texas or New Mexico, there are people who look on themselves as Spaniards rather than Mexicans, and they're proud of that Spanish connection. They didn't like the idea of Mexican independence in the 1820s, and so when the opportunity came for uh, a challenge to Mexico, which did happen in 1848, they weren't as unhappy as you might have supposed. But um, the long-term consequences, of course, were that the Anglo-Saxons, uh, Anglo-Saxons, thought that they had a right to 
established themselves in any part of the, the Americas where Spain had not established itself. And that was the basis of the, uh, that is why there was an, a North American English colony, English confederation of colonies in the 17th and 18th centuries. To return to something you said before, or rather you wrote and I read uh, before, one gets the impression from uh, reading your book and from reading, in fact, other books on, on the history of that period, that the 16th century um, Empresa de América, right, Empresa de Indias, uh, had a peculiar character of its own insofar as it was much more cosmopolitan, much more Renaissance, much more universal than even sometimes Spaniards have thought. Um, perhaps because the uh, main uh, people concerned with it were never provincial or narrow-minded. It's very curious to think the attitudes of people like uh, first and foremost, the King Emperor Charles V, or before that, uh, the Cardinal Cisneros in whose hall we are now, or the Catholic Kings, or indeed uh, Hernán Cortés himself, had a very uh, classical attitude uh, towards what they were doing. They kept thinking in terms that were not strictly nationalistic, uh, but which were more mm, uh, looking back sometimes to the Roman Empire and always to the uh, idea of a universal religion, which was uh, Christian Catholicism. What do you think about that? First, Although there were a great many non-Spaniards involved in every stage of the expansion of Spain, all the same, <coughs> the most characteristic engagement or exchange, I think, in the, the, the great adventure, was one which is recorded by Oviedo, in which he describes how a, a group of Spaniards uh, describe, uh, discover that they come from all parts of Spain. Uh, they come from Castile, they come from Estremadura, they come from Andalusia, they come from Galicia, they come from the Basque country, but suddenly they say to themselves, yes, we are here, but we are all Spaniards. And that is an important thing to be said about the great adventure. The second thing is this, that by the end of the 16th century, Spain had done one astonishing thing in the New World. It had created a whole archipelago of cathedrals, uh, conventos, um, and ch churches, which, which uh, make it seem uh, a, a really outstanding Christian, Christian adventure. Um, uh, think of the, the cathedral in Mexico. Think of the cathedral in Quito. Think of the, the, the wonderful churches in Peru. Uh, these, these were really astonishing. Um, Christian or not, you must be impressed by the endeavor of those architects, and some of them were just friar architects, uh, to have achieved so much in such a short time. To at least 250 uh, um, religious buildings of quality which survive were built in the 16th century in New Spain, Mexico alone. And they printed books uh, from the very beginning. They uh, began to print books with the Cromberger brothers uh, in the 1540s. To begin with, the books which they liked to print were the, uh, um, the chivalrous novels in the, in the tradition of Amadis de Gaulle, which are very worth reading and explain a great deal about the mentality of the conquistadors. Now that's very interesting because that again brings us close to the idea that they were taking 
to the, that hemisphere something much more than, than one sometimes thinks. They, they, they were taking old uh, classical history, roots of it anyhow, and uh, as well as um, the, 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 the Christian uh, religion. Well, the novels are of great importance, which I mentioned. Uh, um, uh, not only Amadeus de Gaulle, but uh, uh, Tyrone Le Blanc uh, were, were taken quite early on. But there were a great many other sequels to uh, at least the first, which, um, uh, which characterized the intellectual life of both New Spain, Mexico, and Peru, and other colonies or settlements up to the, the end of the 16th century. Then you have uh, Don Quixote coming in as a, a corrective to uh, those um, fantasies. Uh, no doubt a very desirable correct, correct, uh, correction. But, but all the same, those novels are st still worth looking at. And even in the case of Tyrone Le Blanc and, and Abadis read, uh, uh, to be read. Well, uh, yes, there is um, always room for speculation about what might have happened on, or what didn't happen. In fact, there's a minor uh, question, but a, a curiosity which you would perhaps uh, mention when you reach the 18th century in your future books, uh, and that is the, the sort of three-cornered hat game played by Spain, England, and Russia along the Pacific coast with their incidents in Nootka Bay and in Vancouver, which is a, a curiosity that um, will no doubt uh, interest your, your readers, and I'm sure you will deal with, um, in, in, with your usual perspicacity. When is the third one uh, going to be published, did, did you say? It's going to be published in Spain in October and in England in, and the United States in the beginning of next year. I see. Why the, why, uh, the English edition is delayed till after the American edition is a matter of publishing eccentricity for which, I can, which I cannot explain. Well, if we are going to benefit we in Spain, and no doubt in, 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 uh, in countries in America where Spanish is spoken, we're going to benefit from this uh, new book before the others, before the Anglo-Saxons, as you said, well, so, so much better for us. Well, that's going to happen. Good. Well, Hugh, thank you very much. It's been, as usual, a pleasure to talk with you and to do so here in the university founded by Cisneros in Alcalá de Henares uh, is uh, a very special encounter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hugh. It's been a pleasure to talk to you, as always.